Welcome. Uh, welcome to all. My name is Douglas Henry and I serve as Dean of the Honors College at Baylor University. It's been thrilling for us to champion 100 Days of Dante, an endeavor worthy of the visionary energy of my colleagues, Matt Anderson and Hilary Yancey, and a project indebted to marvelous colleagues at Biola, Eastern, Gonzaga, the University of Dallas, and Whitworth, along with Baylor University and with support from the MJ Murdoch Charitable Trust, these collaborating institutions deserve so much gratitude for making possible 100 Days of Dante. And so at last, at long last, we readers of Dante's Divine Comedy gather around a wondrous poetic vision of what we have been made for, enjoying the sight of God together with all redeemed creation. With that vision in mind, I warmly greet all those gathered by Zoom for today's live webinar or who watch the recording later. The theme of our panel is At Last Among the Stars, Reading Dante's Paradiso. Let me introduce my friend, Dr. Brian Williams of Eastern University, where he serves as Dean of the College of Arts and Humanities and also as Dean of Templeton Honors College. For time's sake, Dean Williams' considerable academic work and service will have to go unmentioned, but let me honor him as a brilliant teacher of wide renown whose Canto videos have been superb. He'll be a familiar face alongside our other colleagues. Dean Williams will serve as moderator for today's webinar. Brian, it's all yours. Thank you, Dean Henry. Uh, grateful for that introduction and grateful to get to know Dean Henry and so many other people through this wonderful journey uh, through 100 Days of Dante. So uh, like Dean Henry said, I'll moderate our conversation today. And to just jump right in, let me introduce our fellow participants. Uh, there's Dr. Jane Kim from the Tory Honors Program at Biola University, uh, Dr. Jenny Howell from Baylor University itself, and Dr. Anthony Nussmeyer from the University of Dallas all of whom will be familiar to anybody who has traveled this journey with us through 100 Days of Dante. Now, for people watching right now, feel free, if you have questions as we go along, to put your question uh, in the Q&A box uh, feature here on Zoom. Uh, if you're watching it later, you can still put a, a question in Q&A, but we probably just won't get around to it. So uh, we'll also have a time at the end of our session today to just interact with some of your questions. And so feel free to, feel free to put them in whenever they uh, come to you. But let's get going. Now we're gonna start uh, talking about the Paradiso, this final canticle of Dante's uh, great comedy, perhaps the least read uh, of the three canticles, uh, but probably, you know, obviously the, the climax of the whole story. So um, Dr. Kim, can we start with you? I'd love to hear from everybody, but let's start with Dr. Kim. Just when you think about the Paradiso, what are the most arresting uh, images for you that Dante gives us or characters that have stayed with you or, or what, you know, memorable moments for you from the Paradiso? Yeah, sure. Um, I just want to note, first of all, that we were all invited to be festive today <laughs> to celebrate the completion of the 100 days. I was under the impression that we were all showing up in party hats. Um, it turns out I'm the only one. I'm going to commit to it, though. Um, but to your question, Dr. Williams, um, so there's so many uh, striking images and characters. Um, one that comes to mind immediately is Cacha Guida, who is Dante's great, great grandfather. Um, and he strikes me as one of those sort of family historians, someone that you could sit next to and who would regale you with stories of what your parents were like when they were young, what your aunts and uncles were like, um, who would kind of tell you the stories and the sort of lore of your family. And you could walk away with a better sense of who you are uh, and the people that you come from. Um, and Dante is interested in tracing genealogies throughout the, the Divine Comedy. So he's interested in his own poetic ancestry and he traces that line through Virgil and through the other poets in limbo and he appoints himself the heir of those poets. Um, he's also tracing sort of a broader human genealogy that goes all the way back up to Adam. Um, but he also makes room for this personal genealogy that is specific to his family and specific to his context in Florence, um, which is so interesting, the way that he's able to weave together the particular and the universal. 
And I think it's very moving too, as we think about, um, I think for many people who look forward to heaven, there is of course the anticipation of seeing God and seeing the saints. Um, but I think also one of the most exciting thoughts is the thought of being reunited with loved ones and with family mm -hmm. members. And mm -hmm. so I think he gives us this kind of very moving glimpse into his own personal life, which also is part of the fabric of the, of the broader mm -hmm. epic of the human soul. That's beautiful. Dr. Kim, can I follow up with a question? Do you think that is alienating to readers that Dante is so uh, focused at times on the particularities of his own story? Because I don't know who Cacciaguida is, not my, not my family, not one of my ancestors. Do you think that's alienating for readers or does that draw us in somehow? I think it could be for some. I think some there are some readers who read it as kind of self-indulgent and a little bit too self-focused. But I, I tend to see it more as uh, part of his artistry to show us that he is able to weave together the personal and the universal. And um, it gives me a way in to relate to Dante really, because I think we all have um, a similar perspective on, I think, on our own families. Yeah, no, that's great. I, I always ask my students to think, you know, who, who would be your Virgil? Who would be your Beatrice? Who would be your Cachaguida? Because it's going to be something different for each one of us. Uh, I, I think that's right. Uh, Dr. Nussmeyer, what about yeah, you? Are, you want to comment on that? Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Williams. And thank you, Dr. Kim, for speaking so eloquently about the same uh, character that I had chosen uh, <laughs> in my own mind, uh, at least initially. No, uh, Cachaguida is one of those that, of, of course, um, is such a prominent personage of, of paradise that we can't help but be fixated on him. And I love the way you talked about how Dante uses him to look simultaneously forward and backward, which is what he asks us to do throughout the Commedia. But really, I think in the Canticle of Paradise, which is essentially uh, a grand synthesis of the, of the entire epic poem. And so it's, uh, this is a very acute thing um, in paradise. But I'll pick another moment in the poem that, that sort of piggybacks on what you said, and that is the beginning of Paradise 25. Um, and the image of a hopeful Dante, who mm. if ever things were to calm down politically, militarily on the Italian peninsula, um, would return to Florence as a poet. And I choose this particular passage and this image that Dante creates uh, because it explains very well, I think, sort of the apotheosis of the poem, of the entire uh, Canticle of Paradise, but also of the entire epic, uh, because as we know, he famously describes the poem as sacro, as sacred, at the beginning of Paradise 25. Mm -hmm. And he makes a nod to the dual inspiration, both earthly and uh, heavenly or divine, uh, here in the first few verses. Um, but not only that, he, like uh, Dr. Kim just outlined with um, Paradise, the triptych 15, 16, 17, and Caccia Guida, Dante here asks us to look back uh, because he says he would like to be crowned. He would like to return poet. He's hopeful. He says, Ritornero poeta. I will return as poet. And he would like to be crowned with the, the poet's laurel wreath in his San Giovanni, in the place where he was baptized. And again, it's a very hopeful thing um, because he received his new life uh, through the sacrament of baptism in Florence. Uh, but he also unites the civic and the divine, just as he says his poem, uh, the poem to which both heaven and earth had a hand by referencing San Giovanni in Paradise 25 and Inferno 19, because for the Florentines, it had great spiritual significance, of course. It's where you're baptized, you receive this new life, you, you enter into the follower as a follower of Christ. But it also held great civic um, import for the Florentines. It's where they stored their war cart. So the, the very machine of war that was necessary to defend uh, the Florentine Republic was stored in the baptistry of, of San Giovanni in Florence across from the Duomo. And so it's this wonderful moment where he's asking us to look forward and backward. And not only that, I would point out one thing in the Italian, um, and I'll read it very quickly. Dante says in verse three of Paradise 25, si che me ha fatto per molti anni macro, that made me lean for so many years. That adjective macro is used only one other time, and it's in Purgatory 9. It just so happens it's used in the feminine, macra, and he's talking about the rock that was impoverished after Metellus um, sort of battled Caesar as an ally of Pompey um, and uh, trying to keep together the, the, the Roman Republic. And 
in Purgatory 9, that other use of macro is when purgatory begins. Virgil says to Dante, by now you have reached purgatory. And so in a certain sense, by using that adjective macro, Dante is referring to his own purgatory, his political purgatory that began back in the city of Florence. And so it's this wonderful way of looking backward and again forward, talking about the earthly and the spiritual inspirations. And so for me, I come back time and again to Paradise 25 as the sort of um, synecdoche for, the, for the, the Canticle Paradise, but also the whole epic. That's beautiful. I mean, he's always having us do that, isn't he? He's always looking back in the past. He's always having us look forward in the future, in the moment, and not only in the comedy itself, because it's so intertextual, if you will. He's always making reference to other things and other places and other people, but also just his life, our life, the characters' lives. Uh, I was just just beautiful um, leading there. Uh, Dr. Howell, how about you? What kind of what, what images or moments or characters um, stick out for you? I, I'm always struck by the events that are unfolding in Cantos 11 and 12, which mm. is the intermingling of the two garlands uh, yeah. of philosophers and theologians, one garland um, representing the Franciscans and the other garland representing those from the Dominican thought. And um, I love the way that Dante is challenging us to think about um, our theological commitments here. So he has the Dominican Thomas sing the praises of the Franciscans, and he has the Franciscan Bonaventure sing the praises of the Dominicans. And if you pay attention to who's actually in these garlands of um, thinkers holding hands and singing praises, at the end of each one, there's always someone a little problematic, <laughs> a little potentially heretical. And um, here they're being folded into this song. And I don't think that Dante is saying, hey, heresy is okay. But I do think that what Dante is doing is challenging us in our certitude about our theological thought here on earth and seeing it as part of this great um, musical um, praise where all these voices are co contributing to that worship of, mm. of God. And I just, I love the way he plays on that. Instead of saying something like, aha, I told you Francis was right. He doesn't, he doesn't yeah. do that. He, he allows for these voices to have their own agency in the divine comedy. That's beautiful. I mean, I think that's, those cantos 10 to 12 are some of my favorites, you know, because I'm a theologian and love history and philosophy and literature. Those, those are my people. When I get come to canto 10, 11, 12, and, you know, Aquinas starts naming who's in the circle, I'm like, oh, those are my guys. You know, there's Hugh of St. Victor and Richard of St. Victor, and there's Bonaventure, and there's Aquinas. And I think, yeah, these are the people I, I, I want to go talk to. But to your point, I love that he puts right next to Thomas Aquinas. So Thomas Aquinas is first, he goes around the circle, and the last person he mentions is Sigur of Brabant, who critiqued Aquinas in Aquinas's lifetime. Uh, and so there they are next to each other. And Sigur, of course, who denied uh, that the soul was eternal. And there's, there's his eternal soul. And so I, I love that moment. It always reminds me of uh, Karl Barth, one of his great theological opponents, of course, was Schleiermacher. And he said when he gets to heaven, the first person he wants to go see is maybe right after Mozart, but he wants to go talk to Schleiermacher. Right. right. And I'm when saying, you think about when you think about Dante's own context, where he's writing in exile, right, how easy would it be to just use this poem as a platform to other his opponents? But in this moment, he chose he chooses not to do that. Yeah, which he's often criticized for doing, right? And he's often criticized people who don't know the poem well, I think, of just putting all of his enemies in the inferno and all of his buddies in paradise, which is just simply not the case. The other thing before we leave Cantos 10 to 12 that I absolutely love is that his description of these great saints and scholars of the church, his simile, he compares them to dancing ladies, so he says, when, and he says, they circled him like dancing ladies waiting for the dance, waiting for the music to strike up. And they're just like anticipating. And so, you know, the whole Paradiso dominant images are music and dance and light. But here, the great saints and scholars and theologians of the church, 
they're like dancing ladies. You know, this is beautiful, beautiful image of celebration, I think. And if I um, could just jump in really quickly yeah. on what you were saying, Dr. Williams and Dr. Hall, uh, I think it is wonderful. Dante here and in Paradise 25 that I was mentioning chooses unity. Um, Dante mm -hmm. is often criticized um, sometimes for not necessarily being a hypocrite, but of course, changing his mind, um, thinking one thing in Inferno, but saying another in Purgatory. But I think what we have to realize is this is essentially an updating. This is this is a record of current events. And Dante, as hope waxes and wanes, Dante does change his mind. And, and I think that's not that's not a negative thing. And by the time he gets to paradise, he's all for the dancing, as you said. Uh, he's 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 choosing unity. Um, you know, I think he has he has somewhat given up hope of a of a comprehensive political solution on the Italian Peninsula after after thirteen thirteen, especially. Um, but regardless, he chooses unity. He chooses to put those uh, theologians together. He chooses to unite the earthly and divine. And I, and I think it's a beautiful and inspired choice. And we have Isn't to that? wonder yeah. about its impact historically, right? I mean, even today, we know that the Dominicans um, give homage to Francis on his feast day and vice versa. We see we have Pope Francis who has chosen this name. And um, we just have to wonder what the impact is of, of this kind of move. So let me let me follow this up with a question. What do we what do readers lose by never making it to Paradiso? Right. If you read anything of Dante in an American high school, not an Italian high school, but in an American high school, you typically only read the Inferno. I complain to all my friends who teach high school and only take students through the Inferno. Uh, but how would you answer the question? Uh, Dr. Kim, we'll start with you again. What, what do you lose as readers if you never make it this far? Yeah, well, I think what Dr. Howell and, and what you all were talking about just now, that's a perfect illustration. Um, here we have this example of how um, the how Thomas Aquinas and Bonaventure demonstrate this um, courtesy and this mutuality in the way that they respect and honor one another. Um, they're sort of rival uh, orders in a way, and they're showing us this way in which um, they, they operate with grace and with love and with cooperation, which is such a strong contrast to the way in which we see rivals and factions and enemies um, fight violently in Inferno. And, and so there are these kind of counterpart images in Paradise that I think provide a kind of counterbalance to some of the episodes that we see in the previous canticles. Um, another one that comes to mind, um, St. Francis of Assisi, who, um, so Francis in Italian would be Francesco, uh, which corresponds to Francesca in Inferno. So uh, Paola and Francesca the, the lovers who showed us kind of the moral dangers of courtly love through the model of Francis, we're able to see actually a perfect uh, courtly love. We're told the story of Francis who submits himself like a knight to a lady who is lady poverty. And we're told the story of his life as though it is this heroic romance uh, of Francis and how he devotes himself to this lady. And so there are these kind of perfected ways in which we see, I think, Paradise corrects some of the mistakes that we saw in the previous um, canticles. And then I think also just the, the easy answer for what we miss if we don't read can, uh, the Paradise is we miss out on it being a comedy. The whole point of the comedy is that we end with a happy ending, right? So we miss the happy ending. We miss God. Um, yeah, so we, so, miss, so we miss the gold stars. You don't get to we wear the, the gold stars. star head stuck in Inferno. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> oh, that's great. How how would you guys answer that, uh, Dr. Nussmeier? How what, what what do readers miss? So, you know, this is kind of a you know, like I always encourage people, yeah, push on, push on. It's it's not, but but why? How do you answer yeah, that question? You miss you as as Dr. Kim was saying. You do the the pithy answers. You miss everything. Um, <laughs> if Inferno Inferno is characterized by blasphemy, Purgatory is is characterized by intercessory prayer and paradise is, is characterized by the dancing yep. you miss the you miss the communion of saints uh you know one does not party. have to be a you miss the party yeah one does one does not have to be a, a christian to read and and appreciate almost fully the commedia but it's the goal of every christian to to get to heaven to get him or herself to heaven and loved as his or her loved ones to heaven and we miss that we miss the communion of saints we miss the dancing we miss the party we also um do an injustice to dante who authorizes us in verses seven eight and nine of inferno one to not focus inordinately on the bad 
but also to see the good things that he saw. Il bene che io vi trovai, he says. Um, mm. And so we need to make it through the perversions of Inferno and the hopefulness of Purgatory to see those, as Dr. Kim said, the sort of corrections that happen in paradise. And the, she mentioned Francesca and Paolo, and that's one to which I always direct students. And in fact, in my Italian language classes, we were studying this just last week, um, the way that in, in Inferno 5, Francesca is telling Dante and Virgil that it was a single point that overwhelmed them, that is Francesco and Paolo. And that punto also causes Dante character to almost take pity, right? He says, fui quasi smarito, I was almost lost in this beautiful use of the same adjective that he uses in verse three of Inferno one, right? Uh, the, the way was lost. Well, if we stop there, we think that Dante, the poet, and perhaps Dante, the character, uh, condone this uh, sin, the sin of lust. But if we read on and we get through Paradise 30, we see that the same word is used. And I'm, I'm focusing on these single words because they're so important in Dante. He uses the same word, il punto. But the, the single point is not the single instant of reading uh, chivalric romance that is Inferno 5. That single point is God. And so we have this revision of the single point that uh, sort of uh, traces one's destiny uh, in the realm of life and the eternal. And if we stop at the inferno, we, we frankly miss the point. Uh, as I said, we, we get only the blasphemy, not the prayer and not the dancing. Uh, and that's no way to read Dante. Uh, mm -hmm. The goal is he outlined in the letter to Cangrande, whether Dante wrote it or all of it or not, was to take people from a state of misery to a state of, of happiness. As Dr. Kim said, this is a comedy. We need a happy ending. And we miss the entire point of the comedy by stopping at the Inferno or only reading selections from, from the two canticle past the Inferno. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just jump in and echo what everyone has said, but thinking about it sort of in simplistic terms, I, I think about the cooking shows that I love to watch so much right? And you watch and they take you through the process of preparing everything. And then at the end of the show, you know, I, I go to my empty fridge and it's, it's just so anticlimactic. It's a bit like that, right? Doing the work of learning the preparations, but not actually feasting at the end. Um, that I think is what happens when you stop reading the divine comedy um, at the end of Purgatorio. Besides the fact it just doesn't make sense to stop any novel, movie, or play a third of the way through. I mean, are you going to watch the first third of Hamlet and stop after Act 2 and think you know what it's about? Or are you going to watch the first third of a movie, right? Or the first third of the brothers, whatever it happens to be. It just seems... Um, and then pretend you know, you know what it's about. Um, the other thing I, I think of when you, when you don't read the Paradiso, you miss some of the surprising... And maybe you get this in Purgatorio too, but some of the surprising grace uh, that you see in, you know, Paradiso that, yes, Cato, we meet him in Purgatorio and we know he's going to be in Paradise, but to meet Raphaeus, you know, the, the, the Trojan soldier in Paradise, to, to meet Trajan there and to relive that story of Trajan being brought back and baptized by Pope Gregory and to meet characters in Paradise that you didn't expect to be there. But you don't necessarily get that if you just read the Inferno and you think he's just kind of this macabre, grotesque author. But then you get to Paradiso and you think, oh, that pushes the boundaries of my understanding of God's grace. Uh, and again, reinforces the idea that, yeah, my own theological concepts might, yeah, I might need to hold them a little more loosely uh, than I do when we see God's surprising grace. And I think you, you miss that. So not only do you miss the ending of the story, I think you also misread the Inferno. And you misread Purgatorio if you don't see where this is going. Um, so, any other any other thoughts on that? Because I have I have a couple other questions. But Dr. Kim, uh, well, I was going to ask you, Dr. Williams. I think I remember from one of your Canto guides you mentioned you had a ritual of taking your students to go get frozen custard after <laughs> reaching the end of the Inferno. And I wondered if you had a, a, a similar ritual for when you have completed. Paradise. So we did. We did. And one, one of the one of the greatest moments of this whole experience was a high school class that sent me a picture of all the class 
members holding their own cups of frozen, frozen custard uh, when they got to the end of the Inferno. So their teacher had watched it ahead of time. They all watched it and then they all went for frozen custard. So that was beautiful. Yes. Yeah, so when we got to the end of Paradiso, Dr. Kim, we would have an Italian feast. I always, uh, there was a local Italian restaurant and I said, I'm bringing, you know, 30 high school students who just finished the, the comedy and we just feasted, which is the appropriate thing to do, I think, when you finish uh, Paradiso. Um, so uh, let me let me follow up that with a question about, and may, maybe maybe we've already started touching on this. What do you think Dante wants us to do in a way with Paradiso? Like, how does Dante the poet want us to respond? Maybe to the comedy as a whole, but but to Paradiso in particular. You know, how did because he does in that letter to Congrande. You know, he, do, he does identify that it is a work of kind of moral and spiritual formation. Um, so I, I, what do you think about the Paradiso? What does the Paradiso give us in particular uh, that we think the poet might want us to, or, or how might the poet want us to respond to, to what we see in paradise? So Dr. Nussmeyer, I'm gonna throw that to you. Thanks, yeah, great. Um, no, it's a, a great question as I already alluded to a little bit. Um, there, there is this great spiritual and moral import uh, that is delineated by Dante or somebody else in the letter to Cangrande. And, and Dante certainly has aspirations um, that, that are quite ambitious with his poem. He's setting out to do a whole lot. Um, and this is something for which, you know, the, some of the Renaissance uh, letterati like Pietro Bembo would criticize Dante, saying his thought was too capacious and that it tried to range too far beyond the, the boundaries that were, that were really set up later uh, of poetry. Uh, but Dante doesn't see this as a simple poem. Uh, as I've mentioned before, um, you know, the great American Dantista Charles Singleton said the fiction of the comedy is that it is not fiction, uh, that, there's, that there's something greater beyond it. Uh, we also do run the risk perhaps as Christians and as a Catholic in particular, um, uh, of taking the poem as scripture, as Dante might want us to have it. I, I opened with talking about Paradise 25 uh, and Dante talking about the, both the divine and earthly inspiration um, for the poem, almost as if it's the, the word of God itself. And so I think we also need to caution against that. I've been telling some of my students the fun anecdote about what they're doing in front of Dante's tomb uh, since the 700th anniversary of his death last year. They're, they're undertaking what's called a perpetual reading of the Divine Comedy, uh, which, which bears perilously close to the Catholic practice of Eucharistic adoration, in some cases, perpetual Eucharistic adoration. And so they're essentially keeping vigil in front of Dante's tomb in Ravenna by reading at least one canto from the Divine Comedy uh, every single day from here for the rest of time until the apocalypse comes. Uh, and so... I think Dante had great designs on it, but there, there's a lot to be said about where paradise can take us, um, especially after the experience of Inferno and Purgatory. And again, we touched on this just a few minutes ago, talking about the, the import of reading beyond Inferno and Purgatory. So I won't belabor the point. I'll only say that this also has to do with, the, I think, the three guides, why San Bernardo is necessary in the end, uh, because it's not just um, reason, not just grace, but perhaps affect uh, affection and, and charity that take us the rest of the way. Um, so I'll leave uh, the, the rest of the discussion to my colleagues, Dr. Howell and Dr. Kim, but just kick us off in that manner. Yeah, so how, the question is, you know, how, how does he want us to respond? Well, what, what, what's the impact for our own lived experience in all the kind of multidimensional, you know, aspects of being human? Dr. Howell, uh, what, do you, what do you think? Well, I, I think that reading Paradiso gives us a taste of heaven. And um, in its in a in a fullness that most of us probably haven't read in other places, and so the 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 depth of grace, the depth of joy, the end of Dante's own suffering at the end, um, where his suffering is not negated or erased, but it's that the the suffering is in a sense fulfilled. Um, we're given perspective, right? That's what we take back with us is you, you we're left desiring this feast. We're left desiring that sense of fulfillment. 
Um, and it gives us perspective as we're back in this sort of quotidian realities of our life. And I noticed that at the end of um, some of the comments of, of the viewers, um, when we wrapped everything up and there was that sort of sense of, oh, now, now it's, it's done. What do we yeah. do now? And it's, it's almost like a lost feeling because it's been this beautiful sort of journey together. Um, and it leaves us desiring that companionship, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I was I was thinking a very similar thing, Dr. Howell. Um, I think there's kind of a common cultural misconception that heaven is a place of boredom and of stasis. Um, you know, everything is achieved. So what is there to move toward or to desire or to long for? Um, mm -hmm. But actually, what Dante shows us is that hell is where all is stagnant. But in fact, as as we were talking about just before heaven is all motion, all dancing and all singing. And, um, and of course for Dante, it is still a journey, um, but even for the blessed souls that are there, they are constantly in a state of burning with desire and yearning and longing. Um, I think at the very end, Dante says, um, the more I see, the more I desire to see. So there's a kind of paradoxical way in which heaven is the place of fulfillment, but also, when our desires are fulfilled, we are also given a greater capacity to desire for more. And so it is this unending kind of mo movement of fulfillment and greater desire and greater fulfillment and greater mm -hmm. desire. Um, and I think so, I, I, yeah, just to echo Dr. Howell's point about, I think it's meant to teach us to long uh, for heaven, for um, higher things. Um, I'm reminded of a quote by C.S. Lewis where he talks about poetry being something that awakened his soul to long. And it was those longings that then led him to uh, later convert to Christianity. And without those longings, he may not have been able to achieve that conversion. Um, mm -hmm. So I think in a way, uh, Dante is teaching us to long for, for heaven, for faith, for spiritual feelings and thoughts. Um, and, and hopefully that, that leads us to higher things. Yeah, and, and Lewis, who I, I continue to think was more influenced by Dante than any other author he ever read, um, he calls those experiences beatrician experiences. When he describes that Zane Zoop, that longing, aching desire that he first experienced when he read Beatrix Potter's Squirrel Nutkin about a description of fall, that, that longing, that desire, for him, he says, yeah, those are beatrician experiences. And, and I think that's, I think that's, that's exactly right. Um, that's why I love one of the one of the cantos I love uh, is when Dante, you know, is examined on faith, hope and love by uh, Peter, James and John. Anybody who's gone through an oral examination in grad school will will, uh, you know, identify with uh, uh, Dante in those moments. But in Canto 26, when he's talking to John, he said he describes exactly this. He says those all those small loves for good things that we have on Earth. He said, well, those draw us onto, those draw on our love for the good. You know, it's just like Beatrice itself. It's right. God was drawing Dante to God's self through Dante's love of Beatrice. And he describes all those good things throughout the world that, that draw forth our love as leaves in the garden of heaven. Uh, and it's just really lovely image of the, the goodness of God re reflecting and refracting off all these scattered leaves throughout the world that then God draws together. And yeah, I, I think that's what, that's how I read it. It's a desire for harmony, desire for a kind of completion and fulfillment without ever. And this is, I think also a common misconception and, and something worth commenting on without ever losing one's own identity. Right. All those people we meet in heaven are still, the, it, it, in some way, the people they were on earth. They haven't lost their identity. It hasn't been eviscerated. Picarda is still Picarda. Cachaguita is still Cachaguita. John is still John. You know, St. Bernard is still St. Bernard. And that, that's beautiful um, image that I think kind of draws us on. Uh, any, other, any other comments on that? Dr. Nussmeyer? Well, like yeah, you, I just you, wanted to say, I, don't, I, I think there are very few works that could, as Dante's Comedia has, inspire recent books such as How Dante Can Save Your Life, for example, uh, from Rod Dreher, even though it's a bit um, kitschy and a bit sappy, a bit too self-helpy uh, to my mind. Um, I, I'm 
pretty, un, you know, I'm very unaware of, of books that have that sort of salvific uh, capacity. Even anecdotally here at the University of Dallas, I've had my students tell me that Dante, if not the main source of inspiration for a conversion, uh, has been a catalyst for, for personal conversion uh, to Catholicism on the part of my students. There's another wonderful memoir about the capacity for Dante to pull one out of sort of spiritual torpor, and that is um, In a Dark Wood by Joseph Luzzi from Bard College, a beautiful, beautiful meditation after the sudden death of his wife uh, in a car accident and how he was able to use the Divine Comedy uh, to draw uh, himself out from despair. Um, so it's, it just has shown itself to have a great capacity uh, for, for moral and, and virtu virtuous uh, transformation that I think is unlike any other work in, in the history of poetry. Yeah, I think that I, I would have to agree. I mean, even for myself, I, you know, I first read it in the summer of 1995. And, you know, it's maybe a little too much to say there was before Dante and then AD after Dante in my life. But in some ways, my imagination and spirit were so quickened that first time I read the comedy that I then saw the world and myself differently. And I had categories and images uh, for things that I didn't have before I read Dante. And so it didn't lead me into the Catholic Church, but it certainly, you know, uh, quickened my heart and mind um, for the world in which I in which I live. Um, we're getting some questions from people, which we'll turn to in, in just a second. So if you have questions about uh, Paradiso in particular, uh, feel free to put those uh, in the chat. Uh, one question uh, I maybe we'll start with because it's one I was thinking about anyway um what do you make how, what do you make of the his selection uh in particular of Saint Bernard as his final guide one one uh participant asked what do we make um of the fact that Beatrice slips into adoration without saying a word of goodbye to Dante she uh, Question is, it seems like after playing such an integral role in Dante's journey, she simply slips away towards the end. And this other guy shows up for the kind of final two, uh, three cantos, I think. So I, reflections on the guides. I mean, we've got three guides uh, here. Virgil's with us for a long time, almost two thirds of the way through. We have Beatrice and then and then St. Bernard at the end. Uh, what do you make of the, the three guides here or, or comments on them? Dr. Howell, I'm going to start with you because I don't think I've pitched one to you yet. Thought, oh, I was hoping you, this is the one I was like, don't ask me first. Well, fine, we can go. <laughs> no, 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 He's it's easy. fine. <laughs> I, I think maybe where I want to just to go yeah. a little bit um, is to to talk about Beatrice. That's <laughs> so why I was like, maybe not first, but um, I, I know that there's a lot of pushback about Beatrice. Why Beatrice? Why not his wife? And maybe we should tend to that a little bit. How is it that this woman that he was never married to, that he actually didn't really know that well, is such a central figure in his salvation? Um, and maybe I'm doing like the worst thing ever or a teacher move and throwing the question back out instead of answering it. I mean, I do have thoughts on this, but I, I think it's worth mentioning that just because I think this is where my students oftentimes, there's always this question in class. Why, why Beatrice and not Gemma or, you know, why a woman at all? And, and how are we supposed to think about her? And why does she achieve this in a way that becomes so significant for Dante? Mm -hmm. yeah, Dr. Nussmeyer, you had thoughts like yeah. why? Why Beatrice? Why did, why Beatrice in particular? Or how how, yeah. how do we understand Beatrice? Yeah. So I mean, just on the, the the broader question of why why the three guides? Of course, uh, we are surprised as Dante is surprised that this old guy shows up, you know, in Canto Thirty One at the at the end of Paradiso, and and you know the most traditional explanations is per, you know Bernard's particular devotion to to the Virgin Mary, um, you know his his own writings which. Um, may or may not have been sources for Dante. I think they were um, his, his sort of mystical experiences. Uh, but as the, to get back to Dr. Howell's question and the question of Beatrice, uh, I think this also um, sort of gets back to the question of what to read uh, to understand the Divine Comedy. And I think in order to understand his his devotion, let's say, uh, to Beatrice, 
uh, to use a, a saintly term, uh, would be to go back and read the Vita Nova, uh, where mm -hmm. Dante details how he first met uh, and then knew, although as Dr. Hal said, not very well. I mean, this is, you know, using the old troubadour trope of love from afar and how then Beatrice died and how that had a profound impact on Dante, um, both as a, as a man and also as an artist and as a poet. Um, and I, I think to some extent, using Beatrice was almost easier, right? This is someone he didn't know that well, someone who is dead already. Um, I, I'm still not sure how he got it past his wife, Gemma de Donati. Um, I, can, I can imagine in my own life, I've been married for 15 years, uh, telling my wife I was going to write an epic and that she was not going to be in it, uh, not even a mention. Uh, but I think we can understand a little bit more uh, Dante's, I, I wouldn't say he was infatuated, although Dante character runs into that problem. And in Paradise 2, he's still staring at Beatrice. And Beatrice says, yeah. eyes up here, Dante. Stop, stop looking down here. Stop looking at me. Uh, and direct, she says something like, turn your gaze, direct your gaze to God. Uh, right? So she is there. We may question why he doesn't use his wife, but um, it is, a, it is a, a, a love founded on agape. It is a, a chaste love as we see it in the Commedia. And she's there to direct his mind to something higher. Uh, and perhaps that's St. Bernard and, and the question of affect uh, as reason and grace not being enough. You know, reason reveals the presence of God to use, uh, you know, Aquinas' term, the existence and presence of God, but it's not enough to know God. And so we need something more. Uh, and so that's uh, at least in, in a partial response to the question. Well, not unusual in the courtly love tradition that he was writing in as well, right? To have this idealized woman that one was drawn towards that would become a cipher of all the virtues in, in a way that might be harder if he did actually know all of her faults and all of her vices. And so as much as anything, it seems to me in that courtly love tradition, she becomes an image, right? She becomes an image of, of something beautiful and, and human and somebody he did know. So it's not just Mary. It's not just St. Lucia. It's actually somebody that he did know. Um, and yeah, I'll jump in. She, she's fierce, right? Like when we, when we meet her and we see her first, right. And my students are like, you know, ready to, to see the love of his life, but then she speaks and she's condemning and she's, she's terrifying. And, and I think that's an interesting move that he makes in terms of comparing it to the, the chivalric kind of tradition of the muse or the virtuous woman like she's a teacher and she she crushes him uh with her holiness and fierceness and makes him sort of have to step up a little bit about what desire is and what love is she she i mean she says Oh, you're crying. I will give you something to cry about. <laughs> yeah. She literally says that. Yeah, she's not. I love, I, yet. I love what Dr. Hell is saying about you know that, that how how strong and resolute she is because she is not that sort of helpful, meek teacher who says, "Well, you're on the right track, Dante. You're getting there." Uh, when he has his theory about dark and light spots on the moon again in Paradise Two, she says, "No, you're absolutely wrong, and here's why." You know, she's she's encouraging, but she's. She's not going to let him think that he is uh, right when he is wrong. And, and that's an important pedagogical lesson. And, and she is a strong woman with a whole lot of agency who is not afraid to tell Dante when he's got it 180 degrees wrong, which he does, Dante character does. Well, and you know, that's when she invokes the image of the siren. And she says, you went after a false lady. You went after lady philosophy. You should have been drawn on to God. And she chastises him. For that, so it wasn't that he was just focused on Beatrice. He actually he he should have been more focused on her and her virtue. He got distracted, and so it's almost like when he meets her, it's that first, like she's mediating the judgment of Christ uh, in Dante's life, which might be easier than having it directly from Christ um, in a way. So, um, I, I, if I could just add a, a short defense of, of Beatrice, um, I yeah. think it's important too to remember though that she's the one who goes to hell to plead with Virgil to begin this journey with Dante. So um, yes, she makes Dante cry in Purgatory, but also we know that she is 
the lady who goes weeping to Virgil to ask him to help her beloved Dante. So um, I think, and also I think it's important to think about all of the guides as kind of a network of working together. Um, it takes a village of guides to raise a Dante, I think, um, because it starts with the Virgin Mary who takes pity on Dante, who sends Lucy, who sends Beatrice, who sends Virgil, who takes him back to Beatrice, who leads him to um, Bernard of Clairvaux, and then who directs him to Mary back again. And so um, there, we see the implication of all of the guides and we see how um, intercession is connecting all of them together. But maybe Beatrice is most Christ-like too in that she is the one who goes from heaven to hell on mm. his behalf. Mm. Um, I mm. think Dante says she stamps her footprints on the floor of hell or something like mm. along those lines. So there's something of uh, the lengths to which she goes to rescue him. And then to Dr. Nussmeyer's point, she does it at that one point in time, you know, she turns her gaze to God, he's looking at her, then there's that beautiful moment when he turns away from her and looks at God directly, which is the climax of the journey. And the whole point of her going, you know, her, the whole point of her being his guide is to get him to that point. Um, but like all of us, you know, we need help along the way. I suppose. Uh, let me get to a couple questions uh, that we, we have. I could go on talking with you guys all afternoon, uh, of course, about the comedy. Uh, but we have a couple questions. Um, so uh, here, this is, this is a tough one. This is one that we all, we all feel at the top of uh, Mount Purgatory uh, when Virgil kind of disappears and there's no long goodbye. And you know, the same thing with Beatrice. But here's the question. Uh, and I don't know if there's an answer, but what's the significance of Dante relegating his beloved Virgil to limbo while placing one of Virgil's characters from the Aeneid Raphaeus in paradise? Uh, what do we, what do we make of that? Couldn't, I mean, he seems to make up this story about Raphaeus. Uh, I don't know that we have, I don't think we have precedent for that in literature. So, and you know, why couldn't he have made up a story about Virgil <laughs> too? Um, a Vir Virgil's conversion that nobody knew about, and then Virgil gets into um, get, Virgil gets into paradise. Thoughts on that uh, about you know why why Virgil has to go back to limbo and Raphaeus gets into paradise? I I'll, I'll jump in real quick. I I tend to think of it um, as a way in, in which Dante keeps us on our toes, where every time we think we understand the Dantean system of grace or something like that, we have something throwing us off, like Raphaeus in, in Paradiso, right? Logically, we follow logic. We understand why Virgil is in limbo. We don't like it because we love Virgil and we want Virgil to be in paradise, not only with Dante, but with us baptized. Um, we, we all hope to be with Virgil. Um, but logically, we understand why he is in limbo if he followed the system of, of you know, the understanding of, of salvation. So when you begin to see pagans in heaven, what it, I think what Dante is trying to tell us is don't think you have everything figured out. This is a, an, a moment of humility for us to continue to remember that we're not God and we don't have all the answers. That's good. Other yeah. thoughts on, on yeah, Dr. Kim? Well, um, he does sort of create a secret conversion story for Statius, right? We have no evidence that Statius was a Christian poet, but he comes up with this backstory that Statius was a secret Christian and Virgil helped him in his conversion. Um, so we do see him kind of create these um, loopholes for other characters. I wonder if Virgil is just too big a figure, is just too well known to suddenly convert him secretly um, and he serves a function in, in what he does as a pagan poet. Mm -hmm. um, I, it reminds me of kind of the moments of, of sadness where if we read um, in scripture where Moses doesn't get to the promised land, um, there are kind of limits to um, mm -hmm. each figure's kind of function and, and uh, their role in a larger story. And, and I wonder if that was Virgil's function was to, to lead uh, Dante to a point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think, Dr. Kim, your point is well taken that it's a sort of almost Bloomian anxiety of influence uh, at times uh, with Dante and Virgil, to put it in more prosaic, banal terms. Um, it just so happens I had two students stop me before class the other day, and they're, they're reading Dante this semester for Literary Tradition two course, which I don't teach, it's taught by our English faculty, but I am teaching them in Italian, and they said, 
Professor, do you think, do you think that Virgil could have been saved? Do you think he made it? Do you think Dante wanted him to make it? And uh, the, the honest answer I had to give is, I don't know, but if he had wanted him to, I think he would have, he would have put him there. Uh, as you said, he could have invented a, a story, although Virgil was, uh, you know, had had a stature orders of magnitude beyond Statius even. Uh, but my answer was, I don't know, honestly, but I think that if he wa had wanted us to think that, that he could have also put him there. Again, very banal, but but I think that throughout the Commedia, we see hints of, of Dante's um, attitude towards Virgil that doesn't really ever change, you know, his his sort of asides to him, Virgil, you couldn't have known this. Virgil, I'm sorry, you can't know this because while well, you're just a virtuous pagan, I'm, I'm sorry, it's not your fault, but that's just the way the, the cookie crumbles, so to speak. Um, and so I think if, if Dante had wanted that to be the the uh, and a, a component of his, his cosmos, his cosmology, then he would have, and he would have made it maybe perhaps more explicit, I don't know. Hmm. It does highlight the grace of paradise, right? when we see the fulfillment of virtue in Virgil and we recognize that it doesn't matter how, I mean, virtue matters, absolutely matters, but it's not gonna get you to the face of God. Um, maybe that, I, I mean, I think, I think Dr. Kim's point is, is really prescient here that um, because Virgil doesn't cross into parody, so it shows us something about the relationship between grace and, and virtue. Hmm. Hmm. A couple questions, a couple other questions here that uh, I'd love to take up. And this is one I, I, that I, I don't know, Dr. Nussmeyer, you might be a good one for this. Um, they, they're, the two or three questions revolve around reading the comedy as a Protestant versus reading the comedy as a Catholic, but then also on the, the kind of reception of the comedy uh, in the, the centuries after he wrote in the 13th century. Like, did it have any influence on you know protestant reformation did people know yeah. about it uh in those yeah. in those centuries and I'll try i to, don't know yeah yeah i'll try to i'll try to just keep my remarks uh brief because of course there are uh not, not there's not just a corpus but multiple corpi that have grown up around this uh these questions um you know when dante writes the divine comedy it's immediately a bestseller um mm -hmm. the the homicide rate for medieval manuscripts is incredibly high and yet we have something on the order of 880 surviving extant manuscripts of the Divine Comedy, which is uh, on par with any text that um, is from that period. Um, so close to 900 surviving medieval manuscripts. The, the influence of Dante waxes and wanes. So even during um, the years of the Inquisition in Italy and in Catholic countries, um, it was almost put on the index. The 17th century in Italy is called the secolo senza Dante, the century without Dante. There is no, not even a single edition of the Divine Comedy published in Italy between 1599 and 1701, for example. Mm. Um, now, they got around that by hiding the publication of Dante and, and um, essentially publishing Dante in other texts and interpreting Dante in different ways. But even then, the, the reception of Dante waxes and wanes within Catholic Italy, uh, depending on the century. Um, as far as the Protestant Reformation, there was a, a big reception of Dante, especially in the 19th century. Uh, with the English Romantics, the, the 19th century, if, if the 17th century in Italy is the century without Dante, the 19th century in England is the century of the Inferno. So <laughs> as we know, they fixated on uh, Francesca and Paolo in Inferno Five. They fixated on Brunetto Latini in Inferno 15. They fixated on Conte Ugolino uh, at the end of Inferno. And in fact, in London, there were touring groups perfor doing performances of the Divine Comedy. And it was always those three or four Conti, the fifth, the 15th, 32, 33, uh, that were being performed. Um, in the United States, as far as Protestants especially, there's a very interesting book called Freedom Readers by Dennis Looney, who uh, is now retired from the University of Pittsburgh uh, but was also with the MLA for a while on the African-American reception of the Divine Comedy, which is fascinating. So both the Protestant and African-American reception um, in anti-slavery speeches that Charles Sumner was going uh, around giving uh, from 1848 on into the 1850s, he references the Divine Comedy specifically, also Shakespeare and other texts, but he compares chattel slavery 
and the severing of kinship ties to things that are going on in the inferno. So there's a, there's a massive reception of Dante going on throughout the centuries, but it, of course, to be cliched about it, differs in time and space, whether we're in Catholic Italy in the century without Dante in the 17th century, or in Protestant England in the 19th century, the century of the Inferno, or 19th century America, where there was a strong um, sort of Protestant uh, inflection to the reading of Dante, um, even as it, as it regarded the question of the institution of slavery. Um, and you can go and read Sumner's speeches, and you can also read um, formerly enslaved people and enslaved people writing about the Divine Comedy um, as a sort of um, work that does provide this hope uh, in despair. So it's a wonderful history of reception across time and space. And that's just a, a small snippet with a couple of anecdotes. That's fantastic. Freedom Writers is the name of the Freedom the Readers. Book. Freedom Readers. I'm sorry, Freedom 2011, Readers. Yeah, the yeah, 2011, Dennis Looney, Freedom Readers on the African-American reception of the Divine Comedy. Okay, I'm buying that as soon as we're done with this. So yeah. thank you for that. that that's fantastic. Um, lots of great questions that are coming in that we don't have time to. Uh, one of the questions was on the, the Jewish and Islamic influence on Dante, uh, which is a fascinating question, as well as really great question that pointed out that when we talked about um, what Dante wanted us to understand from Paradiso and the comedy and how he wanted us to live differently. We naturally focused on kind of spiritual formation, moral formation. This person comments that uh, they were struck by uh, how much, if you will, secular knowledge is embedded in the entire comedy, you know, on geography and history and Italian politics and astronomy and mythology, philosophy and, and religion in general. Um, and the question is, you know, did that have an impact? Did was that original to Dante? Did that influence um, his subsequent readers? And, and I'm not sure, but that's a really fascinating observation that is that is well worth making. It's, certainly, we would say uh, he had designs on influencing and framing the way we think about politics and church-state re relations and civil community. Um, I mean, I often say, you know, you can read the comedy through, you know, probably six or seven different lenses, right? You can just read it. What's he say about poetry? Or you can read the whole thing for that. What's he say about civil politics, you know? But as far as natural philosophy or natural science goes, that's another lens that you could take, um, I think, when reading the comedy. Let me let me end with a couple questions. Um, Last year, uh, you know, may, you may know Pope Francis wrote an apostolic letter on the comedy, uh, encouraging that it be read here on the 700th anniversary of Dante's death. And he suggests that Dante uh, and the comedy offers an important message for our times. Um, so how would you how would you respond to that? Among the many insights Dante gives us, what what one or two do you think might be important for our times in particular? That's a big question, um, but what comes what comes immediately to mind, Doctor Nussmeier? Yeah, I'll just I mean I'll just say something for about two sentences since I just spoke at length, and I'll give Doctor Howell and Doctor Kim a chance to respond. Um, you know, I think Dante's Commedia provides some important perspective for us because we may see ourselves as being members in a sort of fractured uh, uh, republic that is beyond repair. Um, you know, I would posit that the political situation in Dante's time was at least one order of magnitude more desperate uh, than our own. And I think reading the Commedia provides that important perspective. And it also tells us that there, um, that there is unity uh, that can be drawn out of uh, despair and fractiousness and, and the fragmentary nature of our own current um, sort of political and, and cultural uh, features and that we ought not uh, be so focused on our on our own moment and Dante can kind of drag us drag us out of that um, and so I think that's an important lesson that uh, the the divine comedy starts um, in that di divided you know setting of the inferno with the wailing and gnashing of teeth and then yet uh, has a happy ending it's not always that easy but I think it provides some important perspective yeah Dr. Haller, Dr. Kim, thoughts on that? What, why do we need to read Dante today? Like, what, what do we need from Dante? 
I think just coming back to Dante in this 700th anniversary um, and having that overlap with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, that brought a different kind of weight and lens to even reading just the first few lines of what it means to feel lost in a dark wood. Um, and I, I, re I just remember thinking it was such a perfect time to be coming to Dante as the world was um, you know, lost and we were all individually lost and in our own dark woods. And, um, and I just remember thinking Dante provides such a wonderful model for us in that he shows us um, that he seeks out help from his favorite teacher. Um, he seeks out his first love, the love of his childhood and of his youth. Um, and he sets out on this journey of reflection, repentance, humility, um, which ultimately leads him uh, to God. So I think that uh, is just a wonderful model for, for us as we, for anyone who is um, in, a, in a difficult uh, time or, or feeling lost. And I'll just add real briefly, I think um, he teaches us how to de desire rightly. He leaves mm -hmm. us hungry for the face of God. And he shows us so explicitly the implications of sin um, the logic that comes from what happens when we sin, but he teaches us to desire purification. He teaches us to desire union. He, he teaches us um, to know that desire is good and that there is something that will ultimately nourish that our desires. Hmm. Yeah, it makes me think I often comment to my students that the two vices of our age are cynicism and skepticism, and those lead very naturally into acedia or despair. And I think what Dante, he gives us a way of, of acknowledging, yes, there, there are things to despair about, but yet, but yet there's good to be loved. There's good to be pursued. There's good to be pursued individually and uh, socially, politically, ecclesially that, you know, constitutes my flourishing and the flourishing of the society that I'm part of. And I, and I think Dante leaves us when you get to the end of Paradiso with that kind of hope and desire and longing that we've all identified here. Um, uh, in conclusion, uh, several people have asked, um, what should they read next? Uh, now they've, they've been on this grand journey uh, with us through the comedy. Wh what do they read next? What are they, they ready to read? My, my answer is always, well, now that you've completed the comedy, you're ready to read the comedy. So go back to Canto <laughs> 1, because now you know where it's going, and now you'll pick up all the things that you didn't see the first time around, you know, like the, the second time you read Hamlet or the second time you read a Flannery O'Connor story, you see so many more things than what they're doing. So I always say, well, now you're ready to read the comedy. Uh, but besides that, um, wh what would you say? Where would you point people to, or what would you recommend? I'll, I'll stump for Dante himself. Um, you know, of course, we've talked about some of the other influences on the Comedia and then some things that the Comedia has influenced, but I would urge people to go out and read other works by Dante. You know, the, the Comedia uh, may be the, the apogee of Dante's work, but it's not that he wrote everything else with an eye towards composing the Comedia. So by reading what he wrote before, uh, we can sort of understand um, the trajectory of, of his thought, of his artistry. Um, we can kind of understand how Dante character might have fallen prey to the same thoughts on love that Francesca and Paolo uh, were guilty of in Inferno 5, because he was previously uh, a lyric poet, a love poet. He then wrote his integral work of Prosimetrum, the Vita Nova. He also uh, wrote a synthesis of Aristotelian and Christian thought in the Convivio, his important uh, work that is not just a work on philosophy, but it combines about 15 different uh, genres and materials. Um, you know, people would also do well to read his work on uh, language and poetry, uh, the De Vulgare Eloquencia, on the eloquence of vernacular. So I've given people a lot of things to read already, but in, in essence, I would urge you to read other things by Dante that might uh, illuminate the Commedia um, even more, or as you said, uh, Dr. Williams, in a different way. I think of reading the Commedia. I watched, I, I taught an Italian cinema course last spring, and we watched Fellini's Otto e Mezzo. And they interviewed a bunch as part of this DVD. We were watching, interviewed a bunch of directors, and they all, to a man and woman, said, Every time I watch Otto e Mezzo, I learn something new, and it's as if, as if I'm seeing it anew. And I feel the same way about the Divine Comedy. And so either read the Divine Comedy again or read Dante's other works, which will allow you to see it anew or in a different light. 
Dr. Nussmeyer, somebody asked uh, about a book you mentioned earlier, not um, Freedom Readers, but there was another one uh, about a man it, who lost his spouse. In a Dark called? Wood, yeah, by Joseph Luzzi, L-U-Z-Z-I. -Z he's at Bard College, a wonderful scholar and professor. Um, and he's written a memoir on growing up as an Italian as well, but it's called In a Dark Wood uh, from okay. maybe 2014 or 13. Okay. Uh, Dr. Hal, what would you recommend? Well, I think um, I think that this the Divine Comedy is always there's always an invitation to begin again, um, like Anthony said. But I would add maybe read some of the main figures in the Divine Comedy. Hmm. Um, read the Aeneid um, is a is a real basic introduction, but read Bernard of Clairvaux. Read some Bonaventure's Life of Francis. Read some of some of the other. And I think that when you then re-encounter them, you mm -hmm. will see things more fully and in greater depth, um, just how majestic Dante's engagement is with some of these, these figures. Oh, and then, I mean, I think that once you read this, um, I think Dr. Williams, you're right to say, um, it, it, make, it changes how you read C.S. Lewis. And um, so reading uh, my favorite, The Chronicles of Narnia, I think they just become more alive um, as, yeah. as fiction. If you want to feed your imagination with good novels, I think you're going to see new things when you read, read that series. Well, and of course, C.S. Lewis's Great Divorce, which is his version, in a way, of the comedy and his, his good friend Charles Williams' Descent into Hell, which is also riffing on uh, the Inferno and the comedy. So yeah, once you once you read Dante, then you go read the Inklings authors, you just see Dante everywhere through everything they wrote, whether it's Tolkien, Lewis, Williams, whomever. Uh, Dr. Kim, what would you say? What would you follow? follow yeah. What should people follow up with? I would love to recommend um, Milton's Paradise Lost. So John Milton is, um, I think, sort of the English Dante. Uh, there's a lot of parallels in their lives. And uh, Paradise Lost, of course, another masterful epic poem about heaven and hell and, and about the fall of man. Um, so Paradise Lost for sure. I would also recommend um, Wordsworth's The Prelude, which is another epic poem in the tradition of the spiritual autobiography, um, much like Augustine's Confessions and also Dante's Divine Comedy. And last, I would like to recommend Dostoevsky's The Idiot. Um, mm -hmm which is similar to the paradise in the sense that Dostoevsky sets himself this challenge of, okay, so the bad guys are always the interesting characters and the good guys end up being kind of square and kind of bland. What would it be to make an interesting good guy? And so he sets out, and, and the, fig, the model that he chooses for the interesting good guy is Christ. And so he sets out to um, tell the story of a Christ figure and um, what, what it is for that uh, for that person to to be beautiful and pure, um, mm. his figure is also disabled um, in a in a world that is very broken and corrupt and and fallen. Dr. Kim, that was the first Dostoevsky novel I read, and perhaps for that reason, my favorite and the most um, influential of me of all the things that he wrote. Uh, and mm. so I, I love any reference to Prince Mishkin uh, and the idiot. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Nussmeyer, just real quick before we before we, we wrap up, uh, so another question on Jewish and Islamic connections for Dante. Can you point to some sources that people might follow up in the same vein? Like, what should yeah. they read next? Who, who yeah. were there Jewish, obvious Jewish and Islamic thinkers or, or um, writers yeah. that influenced them? So, so this is a, an open and ongoing question uh, about the the extent to which Dante would have known or could have known. Yeah. Um, some of the proposed sources for the Divine Comedy, such as Muhammad's Ladder, for example. Um, recent critical scholarly consensus has said over the last 40 years that Dante would have had access, and in specific places like Bologna, to um, sort of compendia of some of these um, Arabic language sources uh, that he drew on, especially for his biography of Muhammad in, in Inferno, for example. Um, the, there are many other possibilities for, for sources um, related to both Arabic language and Hebrew language that is Islamic and Jewish sources. Um, the, the, most, the first sort of um, scholarly work to consider this is Asim Palathios's 1919 work, 
uh, which considered the, the Arabic language and Muslim sources the Divine Comedy, uh, which would be a good place to start and also provide readers with leads for, mm -hmm. for investigating. But Muhammad's Ladder is, is the one that's usually considered to be the, the biggest influence uh, on Dante and one to which he would have had access, we think. Um, and so it's still, it's an open and ongoing question. Um, the previous thought was that he would have been uh, uh, had access to some of these sources through Brunetto Latini, who appears in Inferno 15, and the um, Spanish court in, in Toledo and other places. But we think he would have seen some of these things on his own in person, possibly in Bologna and other places. So uh, a definite influence. But I would start with Asim Palacios and also Muhammad's Ladder uh, okay. for, for investigating yeah. this sort of thing. That's great. Thank you. All right, I'm about ready to wrap us up here uh, and send people back to work or whatever they have doing uh, this afternoon. But final thoughts from everybody, just final final comments that you want to leave us with before I wrap us up. Uh, Dr. Howell? I, I just want to say to the viewers how much um, I appreciated going on this journey with you. And I'm particularly thankful for those of you who were um, careful to comment on, on and you offer your reflections. It was really a surprise to me how meaningful it was to read with a bunch of folks from all over the place. And to celebrate on Easter was really extraordinary. And it's something that um, I just didn't anticipate. And so I want to say to, to the, the viewership, like, for those of you who kept the the course, like congratulations, um, and let's let's begin again. Beautiful, Dr. Kim. Yeah, that's perfectly put, uh, Dr. Howell. I just want to echo um, Dr. Howell's thanks um, to everyone who joined this community and and um, contributed comments and insights and um, and kept everyone else accountable and. Um, it's just been a joy and a pleasure to be connected with with fellow Dante lovers. So thank you so much. I I too would just express my my profound gratitude to the organizers of the project, uh, to my fellow colleagues who dedicated their time to the project, and to you readers who followed along. Uh, it was also personally enriching in the sense that I've been reading Dante in earnest for fifteen or twenty years. And this was uh, my own sort of renewal, I think. Uh, at times you don't need, you don't realize that you need to be renewed, um, but this provided uh, an impetus to really get even more excited about Dante and more excited about talking to a broader public about these things. And to be contacted by readers and viewers uh, from as far away as places like Australia that, who just had questions about the Divine Comedy and about Dante, um, is, is an experience that I'll take with me uh, for the rest of my career and the rest of my life uh, here on earth. It's really been a, a, a wonderful, immersive experience in the world of Dante and wonderful in a way that I could not have predicted when I signed on to this uh, project mm. last year. So thank you to everyone. Agreed, agreed, Dr. Nussbaum. I'm getting weepy over here. So yeah, it's beautiful. Um, so uh, thus concludes the 100 Days of Dante Project and the world's largest Dante reading group. Uh, I just want to express my gratitude uh, as well, like my fellow uh, conversants here. Um, and I think gr gratitude on behalf of the thousands of people who have followed the journey, uh, like my mom, my wife, and my daughter all came, came on this journey with us. And so Huge thanks to Baylor University uh, for taking the bulk of this work and for Dean Doug Henry, uh, Hillary Yancey and Matt Lee Anderson for uh, working so uh, long and hard behind the scenes, as well as the Tory Honors Program at Biola, Whitworth University, Gonzaga University, University of Dallas and the Templeton Honors College here at Eastern University, as well as the MJ Murdoch Charitable Trust for all the support uh, and efforts that went into this. All of us were... Um, Thrilled at the response. Uh, I too have gotten emails from Australia and South America and, you know, beat cops in Manhattan and church groups in, you know, British Columbia. And I think the response was just overwhelming and unexpected. So uh, a huge delight, I, I think, for all of us uh, to discover other lovers of Dante and to hear the way Dante and his comedy uh, has played into journeys besides our own uh, in a really lovely way. So for those of you who are asking, the 100 Days of Dante uh, project will live on through the website. 
over the next few months, the website will be uh, revised a little bit to make it uh, a little more easier to navigate. There will also be possibly some supplemental lectures and resources added. And uh, in the coming months, there will be opportunities for people to sign up to do their own 100 Days of Dante and to receive, again, uh, notices in their inbox uh, every day, three times a day, two times a day, so that thousands, hopefully, of other people besides the 15 to 20,000 who went on this journey can take this journey uh, as well. Church groups, school groups, groups of friends and individuals uh, who we hope will go on journeying through the comedy as the rest of us have done uh, from last September leading up to Easter of this year. So uh, with that, let me end with the final words of the comedy and, uh, and express my own desires that may your will and your desire be ever impelled by the love that moves the sun and the other stars. Thank you everyone for joining us and thank you to my fellow uh, participants today. Thank you. Thank you.